So I wanted to talk about hypothesis testing. So maybe I'll talk about a research project I did several years ago that had to do with sort of modeling infectious disease spread on networks. So hypothesis testing, right? You have a null hypothesis and you have an alternative hypothesis. Is it more exciting if the alternative comes true? Or? Yeah, null is more like boring. The way that this is usually framed, it's like you have, you have data, right? Maybe you have some some data samples, x1 up to xn, and they come from some distribution. And maybe your distribution is normal with um, mean mu and variance 1. So what that looks like is, you know, if you, if you draw the density function of your data from which it's sampled, then the, the distribution is centered around mu, but you don't know what that is. So normally, you would want to do some kind of a hypothesis test that maybe it says, well, the null hypothesis is that mu is less than zero, and the alternative is that mu is bigger than zero. So what could that be? That like yeah. That... So this could be like the average height of um, four-year-olds in the country, right? And maybe it's not that mu is less than zero. Um, maybe the the null hypothesis is that oh, well, I'm, I'm American, so I want to say like thirty-six inches. Um, so let's say thirty-six inches, and the null is that it's bigger than thirty-six inches. Okay, and and maybe you want to do this because you know, well, someone tells you, okay, I think four-year-olds are short. And you, you say, well, I want to prove to you that four-year-olds are actually quite tall, right? So that sets up what's the null. So the null is like the boring, okay, they're, they're short, and then the alternative is that they're, they're tall. So then your, your test statistic, so let's say you get data from n people. And, and four-year-olds. And four-year-olds, exactly. And, and what you would do is you would say, well, I'm going to take the average of their height, right? So this is the test statistic. You might say it's t of x. Right? And then there will be some rule for, for whether or not you reject the null hypothesis. The idea is they use some properties of some asymptotic properties. Asymptotic just means that, well, if n is large, then it has a certain distribution. If your data were normally distributed, then it, you wouldn't need to worry about asymptotically. It would exactly have the distribution you want. Um, a normal distribution might not be the best distribution for people's heights because there's some small chance that it's negative. Right. So in reality, there's some other common distribution of which you want to test is the mean smaller than something or bigger than something. Um, and then you would calculate the test statistic and using these general asymptotic properties that hold for any distribution you might choose. Right. Then you will reject H0, let's say, by looking up a normal distribution table. So the idea is that for large n, T of n will, will behave like a scaled normal distribution, and then you look up the table and it says, well, if, if t of x is bigger than, let's say, some, some c, you choose some, some threshold c, and if t of x is bigger than c, then that means that you reject h0, because you have evidence that your average of the heights was quite large, so you, you thought that it was not true. And if t of x is less than or equal to c, then you, then you do not reject h0. So that, that's sort of the, the standard way that hypothesis testing is, is studied in school. In some work I did um, with my first PhD student about eight years ago, I think, we were interested in understanding disease spread. Um, over a network. This is before COVID, but, and, and I, I want to qualify this by saying that we're theoreticians, so the models, as you'll see, are quite simplistic, right? And so we have a null hypothesis, and we have an alternative hypothesis, but the data that we observe, well, the, the null hypothesis, the boring hypothesis, that, you know, I have these individuals, and they're all sort of symmetrically related to each other. In graph theory, you would call this a completely connected graph. And your alternative hypothesis is that there's something interesting that's happening. And with our theory, you know, we can't really cover all alternatives, but maybe we have a certain structure that we're trying to test whether that was the case. And for whatever reason, we want to, to have some evidence for saying, do I like, do I think that this configuration was more likely than this one based on the data? So then you have to ask, well, what is your data? The way that we set it up, the data is just one observation of, for these five individuals, who was infected? So maybe it's a, a group of classmates at school and you know that these three were infected and you want to understand, do I have some statistically rigorous conclusion for choosing one hypothesis or the other? So the issue here is that unlike the standard statistical hypothesis testing, you don't have n observations. I mean, you sort of do, but the n people are, are different people in your, in your class. Um, and you, you also can't really talk about asymptotic properties necessarily because maybe your graph only has five people and that's not very large. 
So what we ended up doing was some notion of what's called a permutation test. This is one version of um, a resampling method. And I'll, I'll sort of explain to you what we did um, in order to come up with some version of a test statistic and some rule for whether or not we want to um, reject or not the null hypothesis. Is the problem here that you just you don't have lots of information? Mm -hmm. You haven't got lots of data. Is that the problem you're trying to deal with? Yeah, I guess the problem is that it's, it's just not really clear what you should do. But yes, if you had many copies of the same thing, then you would probably calculate something and average it out, right? But basically, you, you just don't have much data. You, don't, you, don't, you kind of need to come up with some new creative method. So, uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to back up a bit and talk about where permutation testing um, first arose in statistics. All right, so, so this is sometimes called Fisher's lady tasting tea experiment. And the idea was that there was some lady who claimed that they could tell whether the milk was added before the tea or the tea was added before the milk or just by tasting it. You know, I'd, I'd heard of this when I was in America. I thought it would all make sense when I moved to Britain and I still don't really get it. But, <laughs> all right, so, so, so Fisher wanted to do an experiment to, to check this out. Do you drink tea? Yeah, but I mean, do I... Do you do the milk first or the tea? Like, where I you... do the milk second. Yeah. But I mean, I, I would be fine if, if you put the milk first. I don't think it would bother me. And I don't know that I would notice. <laughs> so, but, this, but this person said they could. Right, right, right. So, so he set it up as a hypothesis test, right? So the null hypothesis... Well, that, so they were going to test whether she was telling the truth or not. Yeah, yeah. Whether she was telling the truth and she had some special abilities, right? So the null hypothesis is like no special powers, right? And the, the alternative hypothesis is that um, she has some special powers. Okay, but the question is, you know, how, how are we going to do this? And, and one thing he could do, for instance, is he could say, well, let's just, you know, give her lots and lots of cups of tea. And maybe you can check, like, so you say, you say you have n cups of tea, and you want to estimate p, which is equal to the probability of guessing right. And so then you would say, well, okay, the null hypothesis maybe is that um, p is equal to one half or less than or equal to one half, let's say, and then... Because she should get it right half the time. Right, right. And then the, the alternative hypothesis is like p is bigger than one half. But that's not what he did. So, you know, if, if you set it up in this way, then um, you can model the number of correct cups by what's called a binomial distribution. You can look up a table and, and, and check it up. So what he did instead was he said, well, let's just take eight cups because we don't want to do this forever. And he said that, you know, four of them have milk first and four of them have tea first. So four milk, four tea, we know which ones they are, she doesn't. And then she went through and she identified which ones she thought were milk and which ones she thought were tea first. So maybe what that looks like is maybe she just got one milk and one tea wrong. So she, she switched those around, right? Because she knows that there are four of each. So you can check that um, the correct number is either going to be all eight or six or four or two or zero. So then what he did was he said, well, now we have our test statistic, right? So our, our test statistic, that would just be the number correct. That's going to be either zero or two or four or six or eight. And then he wants to do some kind of hypothesis test, right? So he set up that null hypothesis was just random guessing. And then the alternative hypothesis is that um, something that's so better than random guessing. Okay, so you see that the way I've set it up, I'm not saying we want to pinpoint what P is, right? We just want to, to do this hypothesis test, or do I have evidence to reject the hypothesis that it's completely random? So, so let's say for, for our example that the test statistic that was calculated, so since I said T of X before, let's just say it's T of X, and let's say that that's equal to six. So she got six right out of eight. And if it's eight, you would probably say, well, she must be, she must have special powers, right? But with six, without doing a mathematical calculation, you don't know, right? Is that good enough or not? So then what he said was, well, what if, you know, we sort of simulated things and we said, well, if you, if you had this configuration of four M's and four T's and you looked at every possible assignment of four M's and four T's, then what does the distribution look like in terms of how many you get right? The first thing you need to do is you need to think of how many sequences are there of 4Ms and 4Ts, right? So you could start listing them down and say like M, 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 T, 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 and maybe M, 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 T, M, T, 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 and so on, right? And if you, if you do it, you'll find that 
the total number is what we would write in combinatorics is eight choose four. So you have eight things and you choose four of them to be the m's. And that ends up being eight times seven times six times five divided by four times three times two times one. Um, so these guys cancel out, this is a two, and you end up with 70. And what you can do mathematically is you can then sort of calculate, you know, if, so in, in the first case, right, what would the, the number correct be? Well, that would be all eight. In the second case, there were six correct, and you can go and enumerate everything. I mean, there are, there are smarter ways to do this than listing everything out. You, know, you can write down various binomial coefficients. So then you can draw yourself a little histogram, and you'll find that, well, not surprisingly, things are symmetric. So there's the zero, two, four, six, and eight. Her score, her correctness yeah. score when she did her taste test. Yeah, the number of, of ways to get exactly eight right. So not surprisingly, that's one out of the seven, 70 possibilities, right? And similarly, um, the number of possibilities for, for zero right is also one out of 70. Because if you get zero right, you just flip the t's and the m's. And I think if you, you add it up, it's something like uh, you'll get 36 in the middle, and you get um, 16 here, and 16 here. Okay, so, so th there's a way to, to mathematically calculate this, which you might have as an exercise in, in, an, in an elementary probability theory class. So now the point is that you take what you actually observe. And her six that she her, got. Her six that she got right. Yeah. And then you, you think about this as your distribution. Now it's, it's a discrete distribution. Maybe if you study hypothesis testing, you want me to, to draw a, sort of a, a curve over it, and I can do that, right? But it, it's like a histogram, it's discrete. And in hypothesis testing, I guess I didn't write this in my earlier picture, but the way these tables come from that tell you whether to reject or not the null hypothesis, it has to do with um, what are called quantiles or percentiles of a distribution. And that's like, if I chop off my distribution somewhere, then how much density is on one side? So that's exactly what we'll do. We'll say that um, what I observed is six, right? So uh, that's what I chop off. And, and then I want to calculate how much mass is off to the right. Okay, so. So in other words, well, sort of probabilistically, you would say, so the probability um, under the null hypothesis that the test statistic is bigger than or equal to 6 is equal to, and then you write it down. And that's this 16 over 70 plus 1 over 70. So mathematically, it says if, in fact, she was completely randomly guessing, what's the probability that she would get 6 or more correct? And that's kind of the way we do hypothesis testing. It's like you say something that or better, something that or more extreme. And then you would calculate this, and this is 17 over 70, which I think is something like 24%. What do these percentages mean? So usually in statistics, you would say that you have evidence to reject a hypothesis if the percentages are something like 5%, um, something small, 5%, 2.5%. It depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to detect a rare disease, you know, maybe you want it to be you know, something like 2.5% to be very, very accurate. All right? So the conclusion is, if it's six or more correct, then you probably don't want to really believe the null hypothesis. On the other hand, you could do the same calculation and, and look at t of x bigger than or equal to eight, and that will just be one over 70. And that's something very small. So with eight cups, mm -hmm. The only way you were ever going to believe she had the power is if she got them all right. Right, right, right. That, that was her only chance. Yeah. Because these were discrete. Right. You know, she couldn't, there was, there was nowhere else she could see. Right, right. So if there were more cups, then this distribution would get filled in more. And you would end up with, you know, potentially there would be um, more little histogram bumps. And if you were trying to say, like, I'm going to chop it off at a certain statistic and, and sum up all the little histogram bumps, then you would potentially be able to get closer to something like 5%, if 5% was your cutoff. So there, there would have been more pillars she could have yeah. sat on. There. Right, right, right. What was the number you said you need before you accept a hypothesis? Was it... It's usually something, so they call it a level of significance, and usually it's something like 5%, but it depends on, on the situation you're in. So this is sort of this illustration of, in, in some sense, like you only have one observation. Fisher's idea was to create more data, right? So you sort of create more data by saying, well, well under this null hypothesis of completely random guessing, like these are the possible outcomes there could be. And then they, they kind of categorize themselves into different test statistics, and then you look at how significant that is. So if we, if we sort of go back to this permutation testing, what we did was we said, well, the first difficulty is to come up with a test statistic, right? So we want to, based on what we saw, we want to conclude 
some number. So we said that our, our test statistic is equal to the number of edges between infected nodes, according to the graph in the alternative hypothesis. I mean, if we sort of superimpose this graph on this thing, then we're counting these two edges. So in, in this case, it's equal to two. And the idea is to try to parallel what Fisher did and say, well, if it was completely random guessing, I can create more data sets. Right? I can say on these same five nodes, if three were infected, then which three were there? And the three, you know, it might be this one, this one, and this one. And in that case, if I were to superimpose this graph over here, I would find that it's, it's a value of zero. And this case might not be super interesting because either it's zero or, or I have something in the middle and it's two. But in generality, right, you would end up with some sort of a distribution. And it would again be some kind of a discrete distribution you know, it might not be a mon monotone distribution, it's just something, right? Then you, you sort of decide, well, where is my test statistic? And do I have um, enough uh, conclusive evidence to, to decide in favor of it or not? Polling those research is supported by the Leverhulme Trust through one of its prestigious Philip Leverhulme Prizes. Now, one of the Trust's main focuses is supporting Blue Skies research hoping to generate new, maybe unexpected breakthroughs which could ultimately benefit society. It's an independent charity that's been running for over a hundred years. To find out more about what it does, how it works, who it supports, I'd recommend you check out their website, which I'll link to in all the usual places. Our thanks to the Leverhulme Trust for what they're doing for all sorts of research, and of course, for helping make this video possible. It would be fair, that is, if I wanted to generate a number between 1 and 8, if I rolled the octahedron, each of these faces is equally likely to come out. Somehow, intuitively, we know that. You know, that's a fair dice, which has 8 sides. And a kid raises his hand in class and said, I have a 30-sided die. You might be justified saying 30 as your guess, by the way. Uh, there is actually a justification for that, because it actually maximizes the probability. What's the probability of picking these numbers? 